uh, our vice chairman Pramoda Regde to escort the speaker onto the dais and present him with a floral bouquet. Mr. Prashant G.S. is a fellow member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and is practicing in Bangalore. A graduate commerce, he pursued his CA course and qualified in November 2006. He is practicing in the field of direct tax and is mainly involved in search, survey, corporate taxation, transfer pricing, international taxation and handling litigation and representing matters at various levels. He has presented more than 100 papers on direct tax in various seminars, conferences, and other professional forums. He has previously served as a co-opted member of the Committee of International Taxation, constituted by SIRC of ICI, and also has been a faculty at the Bangalore branch of SIRC. He has also served as a member of the Finance Advisory Committee of the KSCA, and a member of the Central Tax Committee of FKCCI. Currently, Prashant sir is a member of Banking and Finance Committee of FKCCI, member of the Regional Direct Taxes Advisory Committee, Karnataka, constituted by CBDT under M Ministry of Finance. He is a member of the P Fixation Committee at Adi Chunchirigiri University, Karnataka. He is a faculty at Fiscal Policy Institute, Government of Karnataka. He is a life member of the Bangalore ITAT Bar Association and is presently serving as its secretary. Welcome you, sir. The session is over to you. Good morning all. At the outset, I thank the Bangalore branch for having given me this opportunity to share my views on in this seminar on international taxation. I am deliberately not talking about uh, mentioning the topic. I will come to that a little later. We are indebted to our parents for life. We are indebted to our guru for the way we live. I take this opportunity to place on record my deep sense of gratitude and respect to my mentor, CAS Venkatramani, who has been a guiding force and factor in my endeavor of profession. Also, my respects to CAD Devraj and CAA Shankar, who have mentored me at various stages of my professional career. To say beside and set the tone down, I saw the topic being printed as recent not even recent, it says recent case laws and judgments. In the brochure, the topic mentioned was case laws and judgments. So at first I wondered, is it a deliberate ploy by the Bangalore branch to make me speak only about the topic and not getting on to that? So is there a fundamental difference between these two terms? A case law and a judgment. Because, like in a statute, we are presuming that usage of all words have a meaning and it has come through due application of mind. So I did my bit of research to say whether a case law differs from a judgment and if yes, in what facet and where we stand. And we go on to the law lexicon by Ramanath Ayer. When I quote from that, they say, a case law. A body of law created by judicial decisions as distinguished from law derived from statutes and other sources. Law established by judicial decisions is what is known as a case law. How do you now distinguish this or colloquially we talk about a case law and a judgment being same. We refer to an order of a tribunal, an order of a 
CAT appeals, but we talk about a judgment of a high court or a decree by the high court and how the word judgment referred to in Article 133 of the Constitution when they look at as to what appeals lie to the Supreme Court under what reference. The usage of the word judgment in Article 133, one of the Constitution may have a different bearing as regards how judgment is normally understood because under Article 133, one, when matters have to go from High Court to the Supreme Court, High Court has to have a reference under 134A of the Constitution to say on what basis it's going and they have to give an order of reference. That's under 134A of the Constitution. Now in common parlance, what do we look at in a judgment? What do you, how do you define it? How do you know whether it's an order or a decree or a judgment by a foreign court? Because in, during the course when we discuss about a foreign judgment, we obviously always say it's a foreign judgment. You would not say it's a foreign order. So have we colloquially fallen into the practice of saying, yes, a judgment is same as a case law? Maybe it may not make too much of a difference. But one statement I think I can make is, all judgments are case laws. But maybe our case laws are not judgments. There will be a situation where you will have SLP dismissed by the Supreme Court. Are they deciding any position of law or a fact based on merits of the case? No. Is it a direction? No. At the admission stage itself, the SLP has been dismissed. They say, leave not granted. SLP dismissed. Can that be used? No, because a dismissal of a SLP does not mean the affirmation of a order of the lower court. The lower court might have made a grave error in interpreting something. When the matter reaches the apex court, it may be on monetary limits, the matter may not stand. So, Supreme Court will say, leave not granted, SLP dismissed. So, you cannot say, assuming that it was an incorrect judgment by the High Court, you cannot say, Supreme Court has upheld that by dismissing the SLP filed against it. Similarly, one of the definitions of judgment again in the law lexicon is a judicial decision or order in court, the statement given by the judge of the grounds of his decree or order. This will encompass civil procedure court, criminal procedure court, how a decree may differ in terms of an order when it is given by the civil judge and you have something called a separate sentencing in the criminal procedure court wherein the sen the, he may be a person may be found guilty but his uh, sentencing may be at a different date. You have seen uh, for various criminal cases you would have seen in the newspapers. And then the sentence can be, may be suspended separately which means a person may be held guilty of a particular offence. A sentencing is done separately but a sentence is only suspended which means he is still guilty. But whether he has to be imprisoned or not, that sentence they may suspend. So a lot of definitions and interpretations on the terms itself can be done. You can also say a judgment is a final judgment or the final right or the liability being fastened upon. Then you call it as a judgment. One other way of looking at it is when you make an interim prayer to the High Court. Say for example you have made a or take for example uh, you have filed a stay petition before the High Court and in that you say interim, you have say, sought an interim relief saying uh, please direct the department not to collect any taxes from me for say till the appeal is disposed of or you will say the demand itself is wrong. High Court may refuse to grant an interim stay that does not in effect may become a judgment. But ultimately when the matter is heard, they may give you relief on the matter. They may allow your writ petition or they may allow your appeal as the case may be. But the interim relief might not be provided to you. Whether that particular order when they pass saying by denying you the interim relief, is it a judgment, is it a decree, like that, there will be a lot of differences in terms of how each term operates. But now as I understand from the brochure, it is 
seems to be recent case laws or judicial pronouncements which probably needs to be discussed. I thought we should have some bit of fun on the topic itself because everybody would have spoken on the topic but we are now discussing the topic itself saying what is right and what is wrong. See this is a very vast subject and there will be many more experts who are sitting out here who are practicing day in day out on international taxation and who are in the industry who are dealing with multinationals and tax treaties and interpretations at various levels. I have made my best effort to bring out different issues which may arise or on different topics. Some of it may be common to domestic law as well as international law but the case might have been pertaining to a international tax as I see. Some of it have tried to cover a foreign court judgment also on GAR and impermissible tax avoidance arrangement so that which is now when the present government is looking up to it saying that how to invoke GAR and the repercussions and what is construed as an impermissible tax avoidance agreement and how the round trip financing works and so on and so forth. Treaty shopping, it's been our favorite topic ever since the Azadi Bachao Andolan days saying permissible, not permissible framework of law. So these are the topics which I thought maybe that the audience may be interested. I don't know whether it will really interest the audience or not. But I believe that like how the organizer said case loss and judgment, I believe that this may be topics of importance. May or may not, but look into it. Now coming to the concept of mutuality. This is a case dealing with Deloitte. If you're aware, maybe some members of Deloitte are also here, I don't know. The issue was, in a nutshell, the subscription fee that Deloitte receives from its member firms. Is it FTS or not? If yes, again, the repercussions of payments, withholding taxes, and taxability arises. If not, what is that? Whether the income itself is not taxable at all, whether it does not partake the character of income at all. What is the concept of mutuality? In the domestic law, we understand how a club functions. It's by the members, for the members. When the contributors are known, you pull in money, and that is used for the welfare of the members, and only members, and the surplus, if any, arising due to that activity of collection from members and after spending, is not treated as an income at all for the purpose of taxability. In the normal sense, you may say, yes, it is excess of uh, receipts over the payments have made, so that is definitely an income in colloquial sense. But in so far as taxation is concerned, you bring in the concept of mutuality. You had the classic case of Bangalore Club, which went up to the Supreme Court. What was the issue in Bangalore Club? Bangalore Club receives subscription fee from members and certain banks can also become corporate members in the Bangalore Club. So when Bangalore Club parks its income with a bank, which in turn is a member of the Bangalore Club in its corporate capacity, the issue that arose was whether the interest received on fixed deposits from that bank, whether that income can be construed as one of mutuality because it is a transaction between Bangalore Club and its member bank because other incomes of Bangalore Club was exempt. Supreme Court said the moment you uh, put your money into the bank, you lose the relationship between a member and a club and it becomes a banker and its client because that money can be used by the bank in its normal banking business and it is not earmarked saying this is Bangalore Club's money. You will be given a receipt saying this is the fixed deposit you have. Therefore, Supreme Court said, the concept of mutuality is applicable for all other incomes that the club may generate, but in so far as interest on fixed deposits is concerned, it is outside the concept of mutuality. Keeping that as a background, if you have to look at how the facts moved in the case of Deloitte, all of us are aware as to how the big force function. One of it is that you have an association in Switzerland here. It charges subscription free from the various CA firms across the globe. Why do they charge? For usage of trade name, goodwill, 
and other materials which they may use, the best practices which they might have been compiled, they will share it with the member firms, which is why probably the big four are in an advantage position compared to other firms because they have the expertise which they garner from its member firms world over and pass on that to its different member firms. So, for example, if GAR is new in India, they will have the benefit of that from a South Africa High Court or a South Africa, how they are dealing with it. And that information will be passed on to its India counterpart to say, look, this is the way GAR can be interpreted. Whereas, domestic firms operating only out of India, we will not have access to what's happening there. Assuming you get access to the judgments and other things, you would not be aware as to practically how it's being implemented. So that is an intangible benefit that these members get from being part of this group under the Lord with different names. The assessing officer obviously like most officers do said that this was a specific service being provided to the members and it has been commercially exploited and therefore that the income should be treated as FTS. Commission appeals being seen version of himself said that it is not it is a not for profit entity it is not entitled to distribute its profits to its members i think one of the article 7.5 or something of the deloitte's uh, charter or memorandum as it's called specifically prohibits it from distributing its uh, income and this particular association which is in switzerland it cannot provide services directly to the clients assuming you have a company in india which requires services this particular association cannot provide services. It will only tell you, okay, the Indian arm will provide or a Chinese arm of it may provide you services here. But this association will not per se provide the services because what is the ultimate object of that is that the goodwill will be utilized and they will benefit overall. The Commission of Appeals deleted the addition. Matter went up to the tribunal and the tribunal again upheld the order of the CAT appeals. Matter reached the Delhi High Court. The High Court, while referring to various decisions by quoted Bankipur Club, Chemsport Club and Bangalore Club, they also spoke about the element of commonality, non-profiteering and element of obedience to mandate. What is that obedience to mandate? That if they have a particular rule that they have to follow as a member group, of having uniformity in how they present themselves, uniformity in the way they're even, say for example, their PowerPoints are also customized. You will have a similar PowerPoint by any of them across. If it's Jellard, they may have their own style, and any of the big four for that matter. So it is the obedience to mandate. They can't stand before you like how I'm saying, I will decide today whether I want this particular uh, heading in red color. They will have a mandate saying that should be light yellow with a tinge of brown. They have to do that. And if they say the font should be 7.5 times New Roman in italic, that is a mandate they have to follow. I can use comic sense and there is no mandate for me from anybody. So, based on those conditions, High Court concluded that the main thing they stressed upon is the obedience to the mandate of the association and they said it is governed by the principles of mutuality. So therefore, what is to be garnered from this? Is it that whether every association of this nature will be non It again goes back into the root of the matter as to how your charter is, what the objects are and whether given the set of facts, you fall into that category that be treated as exempt from tax on the principles of mutuality. Considering that facts, High Court decision was in the favor of the SSC saying that the income shall not be brought to tax and that it is not to be treated as fee for technical services. And the way probably I would think is if any issues you con concerning on this issue, if you feel that we warrant a discussion, we can have a dialogue before I go on to the next one so that instead of coming back later on and having different interpretations and different views 
we can exchange views on this subject subject to contempt by the court we are not in deciding whether the court was right or wrong we are only bringing out what the courts have stated and by applying the set principles one other issue now which most of you in this field are aware of is the most favored nation clause it is unsettled what was settled can we make this statement yes of course if you look at history of how the ramifications after the Vodafone judgment were when the Finance Act 2012 came in for the first one and a half hours when everybody is a economist and an expert on tax laws everybody hailed the budget as being one of the best ever presented the devil was in the detail saying that the definition of 916 was amended with retrospective effect and then all of us are aware of the litigations it went through and then the judgment of Vodafone and subsequent amendment again to say to bring out something similar I would not equate it with how the litigation saga unfolded in Vodafone to what has happened here but one certain important points when we are discussing the clauses and treaties would be the power of the parliament under article 253 of the constitution to frame laws and how it operates it is not that law is framed and subsequently it has to be given effect by a particular order it's merely not possible that the sign a treaty and a protocol is not signed or they say it's coming to force. there has to be a separate notification under section 90 which has to be given for it to take charge so the root of the matter in the judgment of Nestle versus a Singh officer though many cases went up what was finally reported was it came out in the name of Nestle but what happened the when the treaties are signed it, need, it is not a mandate that it should be based on the member, the, country, the third party or the other state should be a member of OECD. For example, India is not even a part of the Vienna Convention. Like that, different countries need not be part of OECD. It ultimately, we will discuss it as we go through, the interpretation went on the definition of the word or the interpretation of the term is as to how a particular usage of the word is and they came to a conclusion and whether it is present continuous or it must have existed on that particular day we will uh, when we discuss the judgment in detail we will see go to the first slide don't come to this what are we now taking up here general provisions would be that once a DTA has been entered between two countries, you will have a date of from which it comes into force. You may, have, you may sign it today and say it will come into force on 1st April. It is valid. It is not that it, it comes into force the moment you sign. And it can undergo a change before that date and subsequently you must have one more notification or signature to say this will supersede what was signed earlier and the date of force is so and so. The most favored nation clause, what is the havoc it created or why will it create this? For example, when India and France DTA has a particular definition of what is fee for technical services. India, UK has a particular definition fee for technical services or fee for included services as the case may be. One small difference is that you do not have the make available clause in Article 12.4 in a France DTA which exists in the India, UK DTA. So one interpretation or one school of thought that if the India-France DTA has been entered into after you entered into with the beneficial provision of the lower rate or whatever must come in. But that's not the case. They wanted to have the interpretation or the, the words that make available which were not there in the India-France DTA to be read into that to get the benefit of the narrow definition in the India-UK DTA. India UK DTA is a narrow definition in my view because it restricts what is royalty and FTS by bringing in make available but whereas it's broader in horizon in India France DTA therefore when 
You have to interpret the difference between a India France DTA and India UK DTA and wanting to apply the restrictive definition of DTA. Is it permissible, first of all? What is the most favored nation clause dealing with? For the rates of taxes. It must not so happen that India enters into U uh, agreement with US. It entered in 1990, but certain provisions of the protocol came into force in 2000, wherein they specifically brought about lowering taxes. So when India has entered into an agreement with USA in 1990 saying FTS is at 15% with the condition that subsequently if India enters into with any other country at a lower rate, that lower rate must be adopted is the most, most uh, na uh, favored nation. That's the how we can know it. But is it automatic? Say after US India enters with China and say FTS is 5% for various reasons. Does it automatically apply to India US DTAA or is a separate notification required? That was the matter. When Stadia India matter came up, the a in this case what has happened? The AAR ruled in favor of the, had a particular ruling. High court reversed it and high court's decision has been reversed by the Supreme Court. In effect, they have upheld what the AAR did. It is, it is fine. It does happen. Just that you cannot always find fault saying AR should have been wrong and High Court corrects it. Because AR was a specialized body, they were dealing with that, the chairman had taken that view. Delhi High Court, when the matter came up in Steria, they reversed the order of the AR, said that protocol is considered as a part of the treaty itself and does not have to be separately notified. But whereas in the original decision of the advance ruling, they brought about the facets of the treaty conventions and how it has to be interpreted and said, you cannot say that automatically it follows. You have to have a separate notification for the MFN clause to apply. Without having a separate notification, you cannot unilaterally say, I have entered with some country today, tomorrow the other country will get the benefit. No, because it is, the discussions are happening at a government levels of two countries and they may agree upon different things for different uh, conditions. For example, Deviating from this uh, MFN, take for example India New Zealand DTA. In India New Zealand DTA, you have something called a transitional tax resident of New Zealand, wherein you can be a resident of, you become a tax resident of New Zealand, and for four years after you become a tax resident of New Zealand, any, because once you become a tax resident, your global income is taxable. All of us are on, with me on this. Global income is taxable the moment you your residential status and you determ is determinative and you say that you are a resident of a particular country. By virtue of you becoming a tax resident in New Zealand, your global income should be taxed in New Zealand, subject to foreign tax credits as the law applies. But in New Zealand, you have a specific clause dealing with transitional tax resident, which means whoever becomes a tax resident of New Zealand for 48 months, they have an option that yes, they choose to become transitional tax residents and the incomes that they would have earned outside of New Zealand, which in the normal course should be taxed in New Zealand, will be exempt. New Zealand has got that. As per the Income Tax Act of New Zealand, you have that provision, transitional tax resident. Whether now other treaties who come into play can say, New Zealand Income Tax Act provides that, what happens? Article 11, 12, 13, as the case may be, New Zealand DTA will talk about some rates. Can you now say New Zealand income tax is giving their benefit by virtue of that your rate in the treaty is coming down or it's not being taxed for this particular individual? Can you read that particular New Zealand domestic law into this treaty? If that is permissible, other things should be permissible. Therefore, New Zealand domestic law is a particular provision and when they apply the domestic law versus DTAA in their country, they give the benefit for four years. And once you choose to be a transitional tax resident there for four years, you cannot avail the benefit again. Which, because you can become a non-resident again. Then after 10 more years, you may become a tax resident. You can't avail the benefit again of being a transitional tax resident there. That is the New Zealand Income Tax Act. I think Income Tax Act 2007 of New Zealand, which was passed. So therefore, each country will have or would have framed laws in its wisdom to either get investments or having people of repute in their country 
for various reasons. So that can't be gone into saying why a particular country agreed for a particular clause. Saying why they did not have a make available clause you know, Indo-France DTA vis-a-vis -vis why it is finding force in place in India, Indo-UK DTA. And you also had the CBDT coming out with the circular 3 by 22 wherein they came out with conditions Ultimate, though the Pune tribunal has stuck it down saying that a circular cannot have retrospective effect. So the issue which was going on was that the beneficial terms that you get in a treaty cannot be extended without notification. Though in the case of Concentrix when it reached, well, that was also on a party when it reached the Supreme Court, that sought for a lower reduction certificate at 5%. The officer gave it a 10% based on whatever F, uh, uh, FTS and royalty rates. They wanted to see the office notes of the officer to say why he wanted to give it a 10% and why he was not willing to agree that the rates which they had passed on with India, Colombia, Lithuania, whatever, for 5% rates are not there. So therefore, in the background, what do we understand here? How do you interpret a treaty and its ramifications? Because I don't want to take you through the uh, judgment and say, court held this, court did this. That's for you to read in the judgment of the uh, Supreme Court. But what we are more interested is, how did they come to the conclusion? Because I have to... Uh, make a small submission, why, do I, why am I talking about this, how did I come to the conclusion was, many years ago when I was in my initial years of public speaking, we had a very respected senior, yes, Rama Subramanian, all of you are aware of him. I was, he was a speaker in the first session and mine was the second session. He faced this and I started talking on gift tax and its implications and how it has evolved. And I was quoting some case laws. And audience had some questions which to the best of my ability I was able to answer. Then suddenly SRS says, Prashant, you quoted this judgment. Yes sir, I told him this is the judgment, Calcutta High Court, they held this, they did this. He said, fine. His question was, what do you think was going on in the judge's mind when he passed this order? I was like, it's a High Court judgment. I have read it. I have the citation. I know the facts. I know the contentions. And the High Court has come to a conclusion on a particular set of facts that whether it is taxable, not taxable, gift tax, whatever. But the question to me was, what was going on in the judge's mind? Now imagine how am I supposed to answer that? I said, sir, facts of the case that day, somehow I had to make an escape route. But it was evident that I did not have answers to that. So therefore, after that, when I started talking on recent judgments and all, I stopped reading out from the judgments, but trying to make an effort to say, how did the arguments go on? What were the contentions of the parties? And why did they come to that conclusion? And what necessitated them to come to a conclusion? Whether it's correct or wrong, we are not to decide. Once they have come to that conclusion, we can see as to how it works. So therefore, in one, the important passage in uh, the this judgment of MFN clauses, what is the word is? How should you interpret it is? Because in the protocol, they say, is a member of the OECD. Clause, I think, four of the protocol, or clause seven, they say, by giving the definition, say, is a member of the OECD, the such rates shall apply. Whether should that country be a member of OECD as on the signing of the treaty, or is it sufficient that when you want to interpret this and an issue comes up, when the country has become a member of OECD on a different date, because Indo-Columbia DTA is in 2011, notification was in 2014. Colombia became a member of OECD in 2020. Similarly with Slovenia, it became a member of OECD in 2020, whereas the DTA was in 2015 itself. So the question was, whether the lower rates which India has agreed with different countries at different points in time 
will apply automatically to different other countries after this particular date of entering into DTA. So they had to interpret the word ease. Because when you look at how they have used the term, the Supreme Court says the word is both autological and heterological. An autological word is that one expresses a property that it possesses. Opposite of that is a heterological word. That is, it does not describe itself. And ultimately, dealing with the discussion about criminal laws and how we have uh, interpreted different words, because when you look at uh, Supreme Court in Natara agencies, 292 ITR 444, they say, when you're interpreting a statute, due regard must be given to what is said in the statute and what has not been said in the statute also. So definitely you have to go by what is said and we should also understand what has not been said. So you can't import a particular thing to say, this is what they meant. No. If they would have meant it, it would have been present there. When will the court supply words? Only if the interpretation of that particular clause or a term defeats the very purpose of the act. Then court will substitute its words and say, this is how you have to look, look at it because when a court is faced with the test of striking down a law or upholding it, the view will be that the view which favors that the law should be upheld will always be taken. Similarly, when there are two views, one favoring the SSE and one against the SSE, the law favoring to the SSE must be adopted. Though they are differing judgments, similarly, in favor of the law being upheld and in favor of law being repealed. Sanya Sirao, 219 ITR 330, reading down of a statute. So therefore, these are the principles on which they proceed. When they come to a conclusion saying whether a particular country must be a member of OECD as on the sign of, date of signing the treaty or is it sufficient if they become members later on? Assuming they become members later on, you must have a separate notification between the two countries to say this particular rate as mentioned in Indo-Slovenia DT will apply to say treaty with India and Sri Lanka which is entered in much later for example. So unless you go on to that, the Supreme Court also considered a particular uh, judgment and dealing with criminal procedure code section 488 while coming to this conclusion. Look at it. Supreme Court is dealing with international taxation, protocol, DTA between two countries and which is the statute they used to understand this particular usage of the word? Section 488 of criminal procedure code. And in one of the judgments they say, they are also quoted, I am reading it for the benefit of all. Proceedings under this section may be taken against any person in any district where he resides or is where he last resided with his wife or as the case may be the mother of the illegitimate child. It was dealing with some maintenance and criminal procedure. But how did the court interpret the word he is saying that it is following the district where he resides or where he last resided which means he must be residing at that particular point in time when the action happened and then the jurisdiction was accorded to whichever court went up to it. So, and you also have the judgment in PVG Raju dealing with whether it is present or not, whether the usage of the word is has present signification or does it have future meaning because generally when you are dealing with definitions of these terms, this, that, may, is, what happens, it generally refers to the present. It may also have a future obligation, all of us are aware. But in most cases, it may have a past satisfaction also as to when it has happened and they have, then how do you interpret it? Then you go on to the intention behind the particular amendment or the treaty or the usage of the word. Then you go on to what discussions transpired between the parties when it came up. Because when you're faced with an interpretation issue in a new section where no courts are here to uh, quoted on that or given a judgment, what do you fall back upon in the interpretation of statutes? Which are the aids? One of 
there would be a speech of the minister when he moved the bill, which is the statement of objects and reasons when a particular thing was brought in. That, that can't dictate as to how the law should progress, but that will have a significant impact in terms of how we are supposed to read a particular law. So therefore, considering these aspects in terms of interpretation of the term and how did they come to a conclusion? The Supreme Court said the union has got exclusive power to enter into treaties. Nobody can take away the power because you have power under Article 73 and Article 253 gives the power to enact those things. When will the court assume jurisdiction in the event of an ambiguity in a particular provision or law in a treaty? Then the court will look into the international instrument to clear the ambiguity or seek clarity because they will not know as to what went on. Because Azadi Bachao, right from McDowell's to Raman and Co. 67 ITR, you are dealing with a different, different framework as to whether treaty shopping is allowed, permissible, framework of law, what is evasion versus avoidance. Which means when you are arriving at a conclusion on different facets, it need not really necessarily go into only the international tax jurisprudence, like how they took aid of a criminal procedure code to define the word is. If any of these treaties modify the citizens' rights, then it's a serious invasion because what in the normal course would have affected in a particular way, if it changes and if it's going to affect them in a negative sense, legislative intent will have to look at it and legislative measures will have to be taken to give effect to it. Considering as to how the courts are, are holding this and where they said that the High Court has erred or came to a conclusion which was in uh, difference with how the, what happens, you have this International Court of Justice wherein they do a variety of judgments, not limited to taxation, FTS, royalty, shipping, income. They have issues which are beyond this tax, uh, taxation, but ramifications may be had on taxation also. Whether will you place reliance on diplomatic correspondence? Whether the silence of one party on a particular aspect, can you deem it as acceptance? See, we would, in the colloquially we may know Maunam Samatam Lakshanam. But can you say in international treaties and conventions you use that? So, but it, it is possible. It is not so easy because by estoppel or by holding out when a particular party has proposed something without, within reasonable time if you have not opposed it, your silence may be taken as acceptance of the proposal and if the parties subsequently have acted based on what you have stated, though the other party has not rebutted it, but they have acted in accordance with that, it is a deemed acceptance of what you stated. Therefore, you have to look at as to how a particular treaty would be brought in, what the diplomatic correspondence should have taken place, what is the domestic legislation, what were they trying to bring in, whether was it only for rates of taxes or whether it was the improvement of trade at large. If you are looking at India's uh, growth in terms of the exports and other things, by virtue of bringing a lot of beneficial measures for the business community, you would have grown. Before 1991, you had this license Raj. And how it changed? You had these treaties much before. You had the Indo-US treaty in 1990 itself. Whether did it benefit you in the license Raj? No, because that company could have never come here and set up business even after five years. They would have had to probably go through 6,985, uh, uh, what do you say, licenses, we don't know. But once it was eased out, you will have real effect to these treaties coming in. So similarly, when the, when the Supreme Court discusses about these things, they have also referred to the International Court of Justice and how they uh, interpret this and say that, they say that number of parties must actively engage in subsequent practice to establish an agreement under the articles. Otherwise, agreement between parties in respect of subsequent conduct may be established by acquiescence of parties 
not actively participating, not giving objections. So therefore, it will be very plain and simple to say, look, advanced ruling said, treat separate notification is required. High Court said, no, Supreme Court reversed it. Case law over in three minutes, flat. Nothing more to be discussed because you will have a 50-page judgment to read and go through. But why, what I'm trying to bring out here is, you have the Vienna Convention on Tracks Treaties. India is not a signatory to that. But that is, that, does it mean that you don't even look at that or you don't even apply that here? You may not really be a signatory to it. But you may use what is being stated there as if it's your own wisdom. It is not prohibited. You may not be a signatory, but the best practices you may still adopt in your ways. Because in Vienna Convention, you have the Article 31 of that is very clear saying that any subsequent agreement between the parties regarding interpretation of the provisions, you, you have to consider that and subsequent practice and the relevant rules of international law as applicable between the parties. So therefore, just because India chose a particular country and gave it a lower rate of 5% tax does not automatically give right to the other countries to say, I am bound by it. It is at a diplomatic level having between two nations and at no point in time we can say we are bound only by this. This was in some substance what the advanced ruling judgment came about. But now we have our CBDT which is overzealous sometimes to clarify things which did not need clarifications. And by clarifying things, you would probably confuse at the root of the matter saying, was it really required? You have numerous instances of the circulars. And one beauty of the circular is, it is not binding on the SSE. It is binding only on the department officials. So the circular, I can say, is at the mercy of the SSE. The SSE may choose to accept the circular or not. He may choose when it's beneficial to him or not. Even if it is not beneficial to him, he may choose. But it can't be forced upon him. Therefore, when CBDT came out with 3 bar 22, saying that the third member, for the purpose of triggering, must be a member of the OECD, both at the signing and also at the time of application. This ultimately, Supreme Court might have agreed with this today. But when the circular was given, it cannot give a retrospective effect saying that what has happened in 1999, CBDT is clarifying through a circular in 2022 saying that all of that will be covered or grandfathered. Pune Tribunal uh, said that uh, retrospective notification is invalid because it is detrimental to the SSE because many SSE would have taken benefit of the treaty by applying a particular law and now you can't come back by virtue of a circular to say this is what we intended. That can be done by notification which is part of the statute, or amend the law itself. Then you have no grievance because Parliament has got the power to retrospectively amend laws. We are not even on dispute on that. We have cases as old as Prithvi cotton mills. So therefore, when that is the situation, now what happens to the business community at large? Now we know AR ruled in favor of the uh, particular applicant. Then. High Court reversed it. Supreme Court went back to what AR said. AR decision was against the SSE. The binding nature of AR probably was only for that. Once it became into the public domain, into High Court and Supreme Court, and more so after the Supreme Court judgment, now by virtue of Article 141 of the Constitution, this is binding on all the courts and all the SSEs. This particular interpretation by the Supreme Court to say that for the treaty benefit or the lower rates of taxes to apply, what is the mandatory condition is that the country must be a member of OECD at the, sign, at the time of signing of the agreement and subsequently as well when it comes into force or when it's modified. So by virtue of this, if certain assessors have taken benefit, what happens? Whether it can be reopened and tax have defazened because one school of thought is that once Supreme Court passes an order based on this and interprets a particular provision in a particular manner, 
department can take a plea that their orders passed is a mistake apparent on record because the law which has been laid down by the Supreme Court is binding on everybody and they will be entitled to issue notices saying that our order so and so dated is a mistake apparent on record. Again, limitation law will apply. It's not that they cannot go back to year 2002 on order passed then and say, look, I'm revoking this. It's not possible. Overall, within the period of limitation, if any SSC is stuck with this, they tend to lose. They cannot. They may take other routes, like how uh, Vodafone and other people took in diplomatic channels for recoveries and other things, license fees. That's a different uh, ball game altogether in terms of uh, the sovereign promise to conduct business. It's at a higher and international level. But in so far as taxation is concerned and recovery of dues is concerned, in so far as the limitation period still exists, in my opinion, based on this, revenue will reopen those cases. They are not going to keep quiet because when you had a judgment like Odophone which gave benefit to the SSC, the legislature was swift enough in amending it by saying that explanation, saying that this is what they always intended from 1961 onwards. So here, Supreme Court has anyway ruled in favor of the department. There's nothing more. Even if they don't amend the particular provisions, based on this judgment, a notice can be issued stating that based on Supreme Court judgment, the order of the AO dated, say, 14th March 2022 is a mistake apparent on record, and they will want to reassess or take away the benefit which was earlier given. So it's a very... Uh, I would say landmark judgment in terms of dealing with the rights and obligations of parties and how it now fastens liability on an SSE who would have arranged his business affairs on a particular understanding of law. More so after the AIR ruled in their favor and you had conflicting judgments of high court. The SSE was reasonably at liberty to structure his affairs to say, look, I am now within this framework of law. I am exempt from this particular thing, or I'll get this benefit of this lower rate. I'm afraid now it would not be the situation because the revenues contentions have been accepted because the Supreme Court said that the fact that India entered into DTA with Slovenia, Lithuania, and Colombia at different points in time, ipso facto cannot lead to claims that the similar treatment has to be given to them because what they were wanting is Similar things to be extended to as tax residents of Netherlands, France, Switzerland. You can't give it. So now, all of those who had planned their affairs based on the judgment of the air or their understanding of the law, saying that the country should be a member at some point in time, not at the time of signing of the treaty, their interpretation is now not being upheld. We cannot say really that that interpretation was bad in law. But Supreme Court has said, this is the interpretation. You may have your own interpretation. Right or wrong is secondary. Like, everybody is entitled to an opinion. I can have an opinion. You may have an opinion. But whether the opinion is right or wrong is our subject to our personal understanding of the law. But how the Supreme Court deals with it, and once they lay down, saying that this is how the word is has to be understood in the protocol of Indo-France DTAA, we are bound by it, consider, we will take a small issue on foreign tax credit. Again here, this is similar to what I told about the Indo-New Zealand treaty, not similar in that sense, but how a particular country can exempt a particular source of income itself and still the SSE will be entitled to get the uh, deduction. So what happened here, SSE is a multi-state cooperative society, JV with Oman Oil. The SSE had 25% share in the JV and received dividend income. The AO allowed the credit Foreign tax credit was allowed. It's not that they did not allow the foreign tax credit. And under the Omani laws, Article 8, 
in bracket BIS. I don't know about money loss, but this is what the judgment says, and we have tried to find out what it is. The exempt, saying that uh, exempts dividend received by SSC from its PE in Oman by virtue of Article 25. That, that is Oman tax law. The principal CAT now issued a notice under 263. 263 in its amended avatar after 2015 has lost that litigation zeal because earlier you had the twin conditions to be satisfied and a lot of now it's deemed that the condition in 263 is satisfied. Erroneous or prejudicial, it is deemed if the PCIT feels. So therefore, that was not challenged. Once the matter came up in 263, the PCIT obviously rejected all the contentions. ITIT ruled in favor of the SEC saying PCIT did not have jurisdiction. And High Court upholding the tribunal order came to a conclusion and then the matter went up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court finding is that in some substance they dealt with Article 25.2 and Article 25.4 of the D DTA between India and Sultanate of Oman, saying that under Article 25.2 of that particular DTA, it specifically says where a resident of India derives income with in terms of the agreement of this DTA, it will be taxed in Oman, and India shall allow deduction from the tax on the income, whether directly or by deduction, different modes. It is anyway not in dispute. And they also say Article 25.4 clarifies that tax payable in a contracting state mentioned in Clause 2 and 3 should be deemed to include tax which should have been payable but for the tax incentive granted. Which means under Article 8 BIS of the Omani tax laws, they have exempted that income. It is taxable, but by a specific provision in the domestic law, they have exempted that particular income from being taxed. So therefore, can is the assessee entitled to claim foreign tax credit on income which technically has not been taxed? It was liable to be taxed, exempt from tax in that particular country, whether FTC is allowable, whether should the tax have been really paid on income offered to tax there, or is it sufficient to say, look, income taxable, yes. Whichever computation sheet they follow, taxable, let place exempt under so and so. A specific exemption provision, taxes paid to be refunded. If that is a computation sheet, that how we prepare. So, yeah, assuming you have only income from, as a share of partner from partnership, what do you do? Income from business, you say, share of profit from partnership firm, less exempt under 102A. And you say, taxable income is nil. Similarly, you will do some computation under Roman in tax laws that some income exempt by virtue of Article 8 BAS and then exempt. But you paid some taxes there. They withheld taxes. What happens to that? Will you lose the taxes indiscriminately because Oman has chosen to confer a benefit on you? Supreme Court said no, you cannot. You will be entitled to the FTC because that particular state in its wisdom has allowed you an exemption from tax. It is taxable there. They are not saying that it is not at all taxable there and it is exempt at source, but some taxes are. It is taxable in the normal course. Subject to modify. Maybe next year Oman may change law saying that exemption will be restricted 50%. Then will you say proportionate FTC will be given? No, because here you will offer the income and then claim the deduction. So, therefore, what is important here is that. Not only the liability, you had the earlier original case also, Abdul Razak and many cases to say whether it's taxable when you have dual resident citizenship or residential status, the tiebreaker rule, who gets the rule to tax. So applying all those things also here, whichever tiebreaker test we apply, once you satisfy the conditions of being a resident of whichever state and you fall under Article 25 to read with Article 25 4 of this DTA, FTC is allowable under this DTA between India and Oman under specific circumstances when they exempt the income. This is similar to the transitional tax resident between India and New Zealand which does not form part of the treaty but the New Zealand tax law allows it. 
Similarly, the Oman tax law allows that. Next one, small issue which generally arises with most people is whether the filing of the form in terms of Rule 128 is it mandatory? You have to file Form 67 to claim FTC, whether it's mandatory. What happens if you miss out? See, earlier you had different interpretation possible for what was mandatory, was what was recommendatory. There were judgments to say if you're entitled to ATIB deduction, even if you have not claimed in the return, subsequently bring it out, the judgments then were, you will be entitled to. Then they brought about amendment in ATA 5 to say that if you are claiming deductions under this particular chapter, you are supposed to mandatorily file the return of income. Only then you can claim the deduction. Now filing a form. You have the form 10 for the charitable institutions what you file in the domestic laws. You have plethora of judgments, hundreds of them, everything in favor of the SEC to say, okay, they have not filed it, let them file it during assessment. Because it's only a procedural matter. Now whether filing of Form 67 is also procedural. Madras High Court definitely thinks so, saying that once you have filed the return and you claimed FTC under Section 90 or 91 as the case may be, but if you have not uploaded the form, what happens technically in this digital era of processing returns? The system is not intelligent enough to access discretion saying, look, he might have forgotten, no. This code for it is box. Is this ticked? Paid taxes? Yes. Form 67 uploaded? No. It won't proceed next. It is not intelligent enough to sit in discretion to say whether it is directory, recommendatory. The system process is saying based on what information has been fed into it. So obviously the system will reject it. In the intimation which comes to you, it will reject it. The next course is only to file go through the appellate process. So High Court in its wisdom says, just because you have not filed Form 67 while you, when you pay the, when you file the return of income, you can subsequently file the form and rejection of the FTC was held to be improper. See, we are not sitting in judgment of whether the High Court is right or wrong here. But in this digital era of processing, if you make a mistake of not filing the form and expect to get relief from department, you have to necessarily litigate it. Because there is no way you will be able to convince the system on the other side. You are not talking to a human. You have to convince the system, it will still say, boss, it is not ticked in my box. I don't have discretion. The algorithm does not contain saying, give note here. Most of you are familiar with filing of form 3CD and 3CEB earlier also, which was not in the then uh, manual format. In 3CEB, you could still say transaction arms length, yes, subject to 1 to 3. You can give your comments in that form and you would have done away with it. Now in the online form, you can't do it. You have to say whether it's at arms length or not. And then you proceed. You can't give a note in the form, which was permissible in the manual system because you used to prepare the form. You will say arms length, yes, subject to 1 to 3. And you could not have been levied penalty then because you have mentioned in the Form 3CEB that the transaction was not at arm's length. But now in the online system it is not possible. It is either taxable or not. Either it is at arm's length or not. Then you proceed. So similarly, though the High Court has come to a conclusion that Rule 128 is only directory in nature and it will always be directory in nature, if any of you or your clients would fail to Form 567, you cannot quote this judgment and say, give me. You have to fight it out and then the court will have to give it in your favor. Sometimes, maybe when you file an application under 154 saying that you missed out and mistake apparent on record and I'm filing it based on high court judgment, the system may consider or the person who is sitting the responsible enough may do it. But practically, if you have to understand this, it's a good law in favor of the SSE, but practical implementation of it, you will not get the relief if you don't file the form. That's how the system is designed. You will take a risk. If you think that you have to fight this judgment, you will have to necessarily uh, go through one round of uh, litigation.
We'll take up We'll take up one judgment on Ghan, South Africa High Court. About? Again, the principle here is that it is ABSA Bank versus Commissioner, South Africa High Court. The moot question is whether being a party to tax avoidance arrangement is enough to invoke GAR. Now forget the facts of the case and how they came to a conclusion. We are concerned on the intention or the moot statement as to what we are trying to understand here. Saying that whether being party to a tax avoidance agreement itself is e enough to invoke the draconian provisions of GAR even in the Indian regime. Because you will take different positions to say you are not aware. And one common law point that all of us have read many times is ignorance of law is of no excuse. But you have a completely contrary finding by the Supreme Court in 180 ITR saying that it is a myth that everybody should know the law. So therefore Supreme Court says the maxim that ignorance of law is no bliss and you have to fasten a liability on him is really not correct. So Supreme Court itself is dealing with these issues has come to a different conclusion. Because when you also talk about something called as suffocating scholarship. What is that? How many of you have even heard that? As to how will, which judge uses that? And in which context that the uh, judge uses that word? In Arvind Reddy's judgment, Justice Krishna Iyer, 128 year 46, dealing with the property transactions, Mitakshara and Dhyayabhaga, finally they come to a conclusion saying, this theory of suffocating scholarship will not help anybody. Where ignorance is bliss, it is folly to be wise. So therefore, when you are looking at GAR as a tool to bring out or avoid the tax evasions or bring within the tax ambit the various structures that are done to avoid uh, tax litigations, if you look at the facts about the South African bank and issuance of preference shares and then subsequently declaring dividends, wherein you buy preference shares, you get dividends, you have somebody else is your subsidiary, you declare dividend, so that round tripping happens. Ultimately, it will come back to the beneficiary in some way or the other. But whether when you read the facts carefully, the bank in this case ultimately contended that it, was, it cannot be aware of what when it bought preference shares in PISC 4 and the other trust which was controlling, at no point in time it cannot have to said to have known that at all. Which means at every point in time in GAR, my understanding of GAR is that though they say you have to prove to the contrary, it is if you are able to prove by documentary evidence and with tangible evidence that at no point in time you could have known by applying common business principles or by applying common sense or by common rationale saying that you could not have found out about a particular scheme which has been devised and that you are immune to it. You cannot be fastened with a liability on guard. Because when we read 96 to 102, you will find that it is very elaborate even in the Indian tax laws about guard saying that the assessee has to prove that he did not indulge in this particular arrangement. But how will you prove it? How will you prove? Because in the particular case when the South African revenue held that this particular bank was a party to tax avoidance scheme to circumvent the local tax laws, they issued a notice of assessment and later they held that income was taxable. See, most developing economies across the world work like this. The assessing officer in whichever country he is sitting will want to collect revenue. He will issue a notice. He will want you to prove. But one thing you have to understand in any GAR or anything is you cannot be expected to prove the negative. You can prove anything positively, but you cannot be ex expected to prove something in the negative. How will you prove that you do not have an account now in a particular bank? How will you prove that? If, if I ask you, do you have an account in State Bank of India? You can say, yes, this is my account number. 
Next question is, you have an account in Kendra Bank. You will say no. If I say prove, how? You have to write to Kendra Bank saying, please give me a certificate that I don't have an account with you. Why will that fellow even entertain you? Who are you to him? So this is a, how, how, why will that manager sitting there will entertain your request to say, okay, you written a letter. Please confirm that I do not have a bank account. You suppose it's not my business. First of all, if you have a bank account also, you have to go through the process to prove that you are an account holder. He will not even entertain you. Now, why will a banker sitting say that he, you are not a... So how will you prove the negative? So in many cases, proving the negative is not possible. This, this bank is what a very small example I gave, which may not really fit into the scheme of things, but just to bring out the perspective as to how this proving of the negative works. You apply this to the procedural rules to be followed. The law would say, in reference to a transfer pricing officer, officer has to seek previous approval of the commissioner, which means it's a positive action by the officer to seek approval by the commissioner. As an assessee, will you be aware whether he has taken or not? No. How will you know? You will ask him. If he doesn't give it to you, then what you will come to a conclusion? You will come to a conclusion that you will draw inference that he has not taken approval. This is what Supreme Court said in Rai Singh Dev Singh Bist. If a particular document or reasoning is sought by the SSE from the department and if the department fails to produce it, either having it or not having it, in whatever reason, then you will draw adverse inference that such a document is not available to the department. Because department, by giving it, it will be detrimental to it. Similarly, in GAR, when you have to fall under that impermissible tax avoidance arrangement, what is that? You have to look at it. When the South African officer, in this case, wanted to bring, on, bring it to tax, they say, that the PISC brought preference shares in another South African company. And then what happens? Once you buy preference shares and when it declares dividend, it will receive and it will in turn declare dividends which will go to the shareholders. They will, the first entity will not know whether they have subsequent shareholders, which is why in the Companies Act 2013 now, you have a limit as to how many layers you can have. Earlier you had multiple laying, layering permissible. Now you don't have that. Which means in a way, Companies Act 2013 in India has understood that GAR is being resorted to by using a multitude of companies wherein you will not be able to identify the last person or the beneficiary, ultimate beneficiary. What was happening in Vodafone? One shareholder, Cayman Islands, it reached there, it was exempt. Taxable, exempt, retrospective amendment is different, but you knew that ultimate beneficiary was a single share in Cayman Islands, like that. And subsequently in the facts when the court held that the trust makes an investment in purchase of the bonds and then they derive interest, how will the bank know that this arrangement has been entered into by the other entities where it, it has purchased shares. So therefore, the authorities are of the view that it has to be construed as a tax avoidance arrangement by that particular trust and therefore the bank was a party to it. They said you collided with him to ensure that you declare dividend, you receive dividend, in turn declare it so that you don't pay tax on that. In the normal course, holding and subsidiary, if you receive dividend and if you declare dividend to the extent of what you receive and declare you don't pay tax on it and if the chain continues and if the last fellow doesn't pay tax anywhere the entire dividend would have gone tax free the question was whether ultimately when the bank received interest through it investing in shares and the trust you know, buying government bonds and that resulting in interest and that interest getting to the bank whether the bank can be construed as a party involved in thing. Then the Supreme, then the High Court of South Africa said that the taxpayer has to be not merely present, 
but it should participate in the arrangement by virtue of you being a party to it initially saying that yes you have purchased shares you have declared received dividend declared it has happened it cannot be said that you are participating in it merely because you are overall in the scheme of things you cannot be held to be guilty here under gar it's not that in, under criminal uh, jurisprudence when you are named and accused you have to prove yourself that you are not guilty here you are you are present there but you have not participated which means at some point in time how should we take benefit of this judgment in my understanding we should probably try to interpret this position to say no doubt the first notice will be issued saying you were present or whatever i would believe that the department or the revenue has to prove that you participated in this arrangement to get a favorable tax benefit which was otherwise not available to you in accordance with law if that particular benefit of tax was available to you within the framework of law by treaty shopping or by arranging in affairs in such a way that tax would not be payable it cannot be said to be violative of gar as long as it is within the framework of law but if you are circumventing every possible law with a view to, the intention is to gain tax advantages positions so one view to look at it is that you can also fall back upon and say look prove you, you can't hold me guilty without even subjecting me to trial so therefore we can take make use of it saying that look if you are in a complete state of ignorance saying that all the other activities have happened without your participation in any manner whatsoever you can come out of the rigors of gar but again it depends on facts of each case how the transactions have conspired how they have been uh, undertaken the signature to the documents see a lot of legal ramifications will be there but on first principles how can we come out of this would be to say to prove that i was not participating in the arrangement because the essence of gar is that you should participate in that to be held guilty for libel of payment of taxes or whatever is the ancillary portion of being in gar but the main thing is that you should be able to demonstrate to them that you are not participating in that now we'll come to we'll take a notional interest which most assessees fighting transfer pricing matters would have encountered because transfer pricing adjustments now are the norm comparables is one set because whichever method you apply believe me they are going to reject it whichever method which you may give workings to the last paisa in 11 out of 10 cases they are rejecting your tp study i don't know if somebody has, has really got favorable orders from the tpo how many of you have really got favorable orders from the tpo here wherein they have not disturbed anything don't tell me some 5 crore case 2 crore case which are substantially large enough involving in sizable revenue they will disregard all your methods of comparison even if you are giving them internal comparables they will say no 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 a particular line item in that you are not providing to me properly therefore i will disregard the cup method he will come to tnmm then if you say look no no in my peculiar facts tnmm is not applicable you have now the benefit of other method so in my personal view not that we are against the law if you start using other method for all cases in any case they have to reject what will they reject they will say you have not selected any of the methods then he will suggest that what you have to select maybe in the remand proceedings it may help you because when once you follow tnmm you apply certain principle uh, filters they are rejecting each of them i don't know if they have really sided with you on turnover filter have they not it export revenue filter have they sided with you wages to turnover filter are they with you sorry yeah yeah salary wages and salary yes which are the factors there with you different financial year ending he will not be there persistent losses he will not be there with you 
you take weighted average, he is not with you on that. He will say contemporary use of data. No, you may be selling due different things, he will not be with you. Take one uh, example of an uh, interpretation of a rule. Rule 10B1E2. I don't know how many of you have had taken the pain to go through that rule. It says a comparable or a comparable set of transactions. Which means, in my opinion, when you are applying TNMM, it is sufficient if you have one comparable. He need not even come to this mean, median, percentile, giving you a series of complex workings, 35th percentile, 65th percentile. Not warranted because 10B1E2 talks about a comparable, which means when they have used it judiciously in that particular rule to say a comparable, you should be able to fight it out saying a single comparable is enough. However, if department were to use it against me, saying, Look, I'm using only one comparable, I will turn around and say, Principles of interpretation general clauses suggest that a comparable. And the usage of the word singular will always include plural and minimum two comparables should be taken. That is how you are supposed to interpret. If you are interpreting 10B1E2 from your side, you will say a comparable means one. If department wants to use a comparable against you, go back to the regular income tax provisions, capital gains, when you have the Anand Basapa's case when they said a is a singular, singular includes plural as per general interpretation and general clauses and tell them minimum two comparables have to be taken, then compute the mean median. So now, when TP issues are arising like that, this notional interest is one, not about, it's not that this case is a landmark judgment, not for a moment I'm saying this judgment is a landmark or all of us must go gaga over that, but it depends on how the department is hellbent to make certain adjustments to your income. Normal contractual obligations between captive service providers, you will have 60 days or 90 day credit period. And beyond which, you have now judgments to say, delayed re receivables is international transaction. We are fighting it, but in most cases, it is in favor of the revenue saying, outstanding of the receivables is being treated separately as a international transaction and they are benchmarking it separately. Whether they adopt labor plus 200 or any other bank rate is one thing. But where do you stand in terms of when you have received monies in advance and you also for certain payments received it late. You have two distinct contacts going on with the same party. Overall if you look at your p and account you have received enough and more before the due date. But if you go contract wise Contract number one, you received in advance, no adjustment. Contract two, no adjustment. Contract three, received beyond the period. So how will you compute it? Department says, I will tax you for that particular contract, you have not received it. That is their way of understanding and interpretation to say, I am looking at the transaction. But if you look at the transaction as a whole, you cannot come to that conclusion. You have to necessarily give effect to the entire amounts received what was the amount due and then if at all after the intra adjustment between received as advances for different projects vis-a-vis -vis amounts received because the moment the amounts come into your bank account unless there is a specific direction in that agreement saying the money received for this particular project can't be used for others also and you earmark have it in a separate bank account you can't use it then maybe de department may have according to me a slight chance of coming to the conclusion but you have to prove necessarily in most cases that you have not borrowed funds because once you have borrowed how will you prove you have to prove that you have not used monies from the borrowed funds it is like spending money out of general reserves vis-a-vis -vis borrowed funds if your general reserves are more than the borrowed funds you can always take a plea that you have spent out of your general reserve and funds if it is not enough, then they will say, you have to pay tax on that, by making TP adjustment. Matter in Delhi High Court was also something similar. You had outstanding receivables and the company was a debt-free company. It did not have any outside debts. So therefore, the department obviously held that outstanding receivables is a separate international transaction. They will bookmark. 
what they did selectively like they cannot cherry pick the comparables they cherry pick the transactions here they selected only such of those contracts where the amounts were received late they ignored what was received in advance they said boss it's not us what is delayed i will look into it they went with that particular approach ultimately did not find favor with the high court why am i bringing this up here i am not saying it's a landmark judgment but this is what's happening now on a day to day basis with the tp proceedings for every particular item you are depicting on your income the department wants to say look you should have earned more and you should generally take one out of the way argument i don't know how many of you take it may not really you may not you will not win how many of you have taken a plea of article 14 of the constitution when you are replying to tp notices what is happening your margin is 15% he is comparing you with 10 other companies who are having 17 18 up to 80 correct have at any point in time no doubt that what is applied to a third party cannot apply to others universally but have you at least made an effort to say that to ask them there is no harm in you making an application look my company is 15% my comparables range from 4% to 80% which means somebody in the similar line of business is making 80% and you are trying to tell me i am falling within the 35th and 65th percentile and my margin at 19% is arm's length what happens to the fellow who is paying 4% if he is compared to the 80% and if he is at arm's length is it judicious somebody is earning only 4% and as per department's admission they are doing the study very scientifically they are selecting comparables on a very scientific basis and if department is saying in the set of comparables they choose a company with 4% margin and another with 80% margin in the computation of the company which has earned 4% are they even saying that 80% should have the margin we will not win this i'm telling you they will strike it down but how many of you even made an effort saying that you are subjecting me to unjust taxation which is violative of article 14 let them reply no harm one more extra round of litigation for them or you will get extra 15 days to respond because they have to apply their mind he has to first read what you are trying to bring out he will say you prove i will say you have taken this comparables give me evidence that you have subjected others to higher rate of tax some officers will come back and say that is not your business this is not how government works and you cannot say that i have to tax them at a particular rate and they will give the reasons but this will get you some time and the officer next time before issuing a notice will think twice say for this assessee should i really write this in the notice or not even if you succeed in implanting that you will keep breaking up this issues i'm sure my friend manish will agree with me we've had this things many times when we have uh, drafted for his company and most times he has told nene prashant bhai this is very harsh on the department please remove it but it has happened but you should take a chance you cannot you are not subservient to your tpo he is first of the authorities in the picking order so you can't give him the respect that the cji of india deserves no you have to treat him as to yes he is an officer getting a salary his duty is to make additions but at the same time prove it to him time and again when you get the reversals from tribunal to say look you made an addition with 80% the demand is zero you made with 1 crore demand is zero it has to you have to get back to the tpos with replies because in my opinion though it's recorded i without fear of contradiction i can say before drp most matters are resulting in farce they are, we are not getting any favorable outcomes from the drp in most issues even in issues of non providing of data also so therefore the law in so far as the advance is concerned this will all be subject to what goes on in the mind of the officer if he is judicious enough he will say total money received is more than well within time therefore no adjustment is warranted somebody is over enthusiastic will ignore your advances and bring it this is one thing which will come up capacity utilization is one thing now which is haunting most companies they will not give you a basis and any basis you give he will say this working is not in accordance with law or this is not acceptable you may give him idle adjustment you say bench strength 80 people project with big mnc you give him whatever working he will reject it 
the same time he will fail to give you a uh, corresponding relief because have you ever seen them accepting single customer risk there are some cases where they have accepted but for how many captive service providers is the department accepting single customer risk they don't they compare you with Infosys you may be a captive service provider they will compare you with LNT and Infosys but they will not look into the fact that if your parent company in different part whichever part of the world it is if they decide tomorrow that they don't want to do business here there is no transfer pricing there is no income there is no company there must be some risk for that that single customer risk I don't think they're giving it in most cases we are asking for it but we are not getting it and whatever working you provide including there was a case where the TPO went to the extent of checking the educational qualifications of the employees and wanted to deny benefit saying look you have a qualified he is so qualified he is doing this job therefore your nature of activity itself was different is it possible most software engineers today would have done mechanical engineering in the thing then joined Infosys Wipro and TCS so if you take his principal degree he will say mechanical and civil engineer he is doing coding and testing in Infosys if a TPO takes details from you saying which are the engineers you employed in a particular project and you give A, B, C, D qualifications B, E, mechanical, B, E, civil he will say boss what are they doing in software this is how the TPOs are doing I have had this experience I won it at tribunal is secondary but this is the extent to which department has gone taking the educational qualifications of employees then classify your services as something else they said see this fellow is so qualified so therefore you are entering that service pass how is it possible I am doing a particular act he may be qualified but it is like an M MCOM fellow applying for a post of a peon it happens in government agencies can you say that he is a finance officer just because he is applied for the post of the peon he may be having qualifications good enough to become a finance officer but his, his designation there is a peon like that department has even changed the nature of services based on the educational qualifications of employees so beware as to at what range department can proceed in terms of making TP adjustments probably we'll take one last case before we wind up we'll take Samsung's case again on one of the hotly contested topics always of P whether you have covered in article 7 read with article 5 the number of days and before this there's a very small case which had a very peculiar uh, facts about the number of days that somebody must be present in a contract we'll take that and then come back to the Samsung taxability in a fiscal year again not that it's a landmark judgment but how the interpretation goes when you're dealing with treaties again at no point in time this is uh, a landmark this is advanced ruling but only to bring about how you can interpret a particular provision the duration of the applicant was 13 months spread over two years the issue was in the first year where it was only 85 days the criteria that article 7 read with article 5 fixed generally in most DTS where you have 90 days or 180 days of continuous presence is not satisfied but if you look at the project as a whole spread over two years you are satisfying the number of days criteria then the advanced ruling held that the phrase uses any fiscal year in article 5 it does not use in every fiscal year the phrase used in article 5 is any fiscal year which means if the duration of the project is more than uh, the stipulated period of 180 days or 300 days or 360 days as the case may be if in any fiscal year the project has exceeded even though it encompasses more than one fiscal year 
you will be taxable by saying that you will be having a PE in both the years or three years as the case may be. If the project was spread over three years, come to the previous slide, it was 85 and 306, it was so possible it could have been 85, 85 and then 220. Even then, again the interpretation was on the word any fiscal year. Judgment may not be really relevant, but I am on the point of how interpreting every term would change the manner in which, the way in which we look at a particular subject. Had the term being used was every fiscal year. It was clear cut saying you should look at it year wise. By using any fiscal year, they have not said that you should combine and look at it. Now, how will you come to a conclusion that any fiscal year would mean the project as a whole, then you look into why is article 7, you know it is business profits, you know why you are pressing article 5 into the picture and then when you look at the intention behind taxing a particular applicant under article 7 read with article 5, the intention is that he should have a permanent establishment. By virtue of him executing it over multiple fiscal years, the objective of treating his income as business profit is satisfied here. Therefore, the term any fiscal year has been understood to mean in any of the fiscal years, if the project duration encompasses more than one tax period, you are going to bring it to tax in both the years as if having a PE and subject to the rate of tax, which for a foreign company, of course, may be 40% per, or as the case may be with whichever way. But why I brought this up is, Again, interpretation of the different terms. Because we may have 100 case laws in dealing with fiscal year, what is PE, whether uh, dependent PE, service PE, I think we have, right from Morgan Stanley, we have been reading it, understanding it, uh, and relearning it. It's happening, right from 2007, from Morgan Stanley, Ishikawa Jima, we have been doing it. But I have tried to bring out such of those cases to say, just to give a uh, different face lift to it saying how small terminology is used in DTAs will impact the taxation. We will quickly run through Samsung and close. Samsung's facts for that, the ONGC awarded a turnkey contract to Samsung and LNT for carrying out certain work, survey, designing, engineering, procurement, installation, various things. Samsung set up a project office in Mumbai. The reason was it should act as a facilitator between ONGC, LNT. They have to discuss because it is a turnkey between Samsung, ONGC, and LNT. You need quite somebody to discuss with them. And of course, when you're opening a project office, you require RBI permission, very well known, and you have to bring out the why it was established and RBI has to permit you. And once RBI has permit you, permitted you to have it as a project office or a license office as the case may be, the taxation or taxability differs. Having a PE will differ from having it as a project office only for merely for communication purposes. Department, of course, in its all its wisdom said that the entire project is a turnkey. Therefore, the entire profits will arise only in India for the project. Then you will have to necessarily travel to what is a fixed place P under Article 5.1 for to apply. And the mandatory condition is that for it to be treated as a PE, the business must be carried out wholly or partly from that particular place. If not, the ingredients of 5.1 is not satisfied. So therefore, ability or the requirement of bringing the tax under Article 7 read with Article 5.1 would not be satisfied. Supreme Court finally, when it arrived at its conclusion, said that and any office which is established merely for the sake of uh, communication is not covered in the character of PE. Again, I have chosen this only to say the usage of certain terminologies and how 
the courts are looking into it. If any activity which was resulting in a dominant business decision being taken here, or if they were able to establish, establish that the business was being carried out through board decisions being taken in that project office, what would have happened to RBA permission, taxability, violation of other laws is on a different footing. But in so far as taxability under the Indian tax laws is concerned, Supreme Court said if you are proved that it is only for the sake of communication, you cannot say it is a fixed place PE. They also relied upon the landmark judgment of Formula One and E-funds. We are not getting on to E-funds and Formula One. But I want to only bring it out to you saying that how courts are looking into it how minutely they are examining different terms of the contract or uh, the substance or form. If you go by department, they say you have an office, you are doing business, therefore it is being done through this office. It is a simple interpretation even the child can give. You have an office, yes, you are doing business, yes, so therefore pay taxes. But that is not what it is. When you have a dependent place PE, a fixed place PE and a service P, they operate differently in different fields to tax at different points in time. So therefore, for any contract, may it be this, it reaches the Supreme Court. But we should make an effort to understand that just because department contends that either we have a fixed place or not, we may want to contend differently. In a particular case, we may want to contend that this is fixed place. You should be able to make a case out of it. Saying that, writing a letter to RBA saying, I am now doing business here and decision is being taken here. Dep so, department cannot say you can't do business. So therefore, you must know what your ultimate requirement is, either to be treated it as PE or not, and then have your documentation according to it. Because ultimately, the courts will go by the documents and the contracts executed, unless they are ultra the constitution. Because you have one Supreme Court judgment in Mangalur Ganesh Bidi works, wherein Supreme Court says, the assessing officer cannot rewrite the agreement. He has to only understand and interpret the agreement because he cannot rewrite it. So therefore, taking a cue from the Supreme Court judgments when they say that you can't rewrite the agreement, if your intention is only to setting up a communication office and you demonstrate that no business has actually been transacted here or decisions have been taken from this particular office, you cannot bring it to tax. This is some substance on interpretation of these terms. So there are many more things to discuss, but I think we have had a good 90 minutes or 100 minutes of discussion. So I would take it as a mandate from the organizers that we have to close at 1.30. Thank you for a very patient hearing. Thank you. Any questions, members? What is the menu in the food will be the first question. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll stand there and answer. Yes, sir. In case of FTC, the income is taxable abroad. But it is exempted. No, when it is taxed in India, we can take tax, uh, credit for the tax. That's okay. what you mentioned. Yes. What we are mentioning is under the DTA between India and Oman, yeah. read with Article 25 2 and 25 yes, 4 yes. of the uh, article there, and by the Omani tax laws, when they specifically exempted a particular, it was taxable, but they gave an exemption. The court held that you can take the foreign tax credit because we are offering that income to tax in India. Yes. It is exempt yeah, abroad. Yeah. You are offering it here. You will be eligible to take the credit. I see. How do you quantify that? How do you quantify that? Because he is not paying any tax at all. No. no how, Sorry. How, how, will, no, how will you take credit? Uh, yeah. Unless something you have paid there, yeah. there is no question of you taking credit. So the quantification is the tax what you have paid there. When you are declaring the income here, for example, if you are declaring 5 lakhs in Indian rupees as 
as converted into income earned abroad, you would have earned, you would have paid some taxes there, which okay. is why you want to claim that as foreign tax credit here. Otherwise, wh what will you claim it but as otherwise? Here in this case, it is exempted. You say, I, I want to be paying any tax abroad at all. No, sir, if you have not paid any tax abroad, if no tax has been paid by you, if that country is exempting that entire income, Correct. as a uh, person filing returns in India, global income is taxable, you offer that in your income, there is no tax paid either in India or elsewhere, in the normal course you pay tax. I am not able to uh, get the issue as to where uh, the quantification issue is coming up. The quantification will come only if tax has been paid by you outside India Correct. on a particular source of income which ultimately that particular country decides to exempt it from tax. Okay. They have withheld taxes but ultimately say it is not taxable because you have a withholding in the country. When you earn a particular source of income, they may say yes you have earned say 1 lakh as dividends in Oman and you may have a dividend tax in Oman for 5%. Yeah. And then they say by virtue of article 8 BIS of Oman treaty they say while filing returns in Oman it is exempt for you which means you will you are entitled to either refund or otherwise if you are getting refund in Oman if you are getting the refund of taxes in Oman, you can't claim it as credit here. Yeah. If it is not, they may exempt it and then you have, to, that's a quantification. So, in India, when we file the return, so we pay the taxes on that income also. You, and we you, don't have, take you have to pay, you have to pay, it is not exempt in India. That's you, what I am coming to the, so, uh, the thing is that only if there is a payment, uh, if there is outflow of tax, then only we can take a credit, otherwise we can't take the credit. So I think the, the entire essence of the tax credit is that some tax has to be paid by you outside India for you to take credit here. Yeah. Notional yeah. taxes you can't take credit. What they would have levied, you can't yeah, take credit. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Department is entitled to tax your notional interest. You cannot say notional tax, I will take credit. Okay. Thank you. You will have to take credit for actual taxes paid. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Anything else? Yes, madam. Very much. Non-resident entities are having a, a third party in India, that is a recruitment agency sort of person, who will be hiring some consultant on behalf of them and they will be working directly with the non-resident entity. So in this triangle of one consultant, recruitment agency and then a non-resident, how the PE triggerance would impact? No, no, see, if you're talking about an agency, again you have to look into whether it's a dependent agency PE for you, how the activities are between and the nature of services or transactions that you're entering with them. If you're having a recruitment agency, whom you have a contractual obligation to provide some services to you. Say you are in US and you have a recruitment agency here. Is it your arm, first of all, to say that it's a PE, it must be your own arm. Or else, if it's a different entity, it is like dealing with a third party. If it's your own arm, you're dealing with this particular office, it gets on to the nature of activities being conducted from that particular premises. If you are carrying out business, if you are doing the recruitment process from here, and supplying manpower to different entities of yours worldwide, the activity is happening from here, which means you're deemed to have a fixed place P in that particular place here. And then they will proceed to determine whether, is it at arm's length, what you charge and what you're getting, then ultimately following the Morgan Stanley principle, they may say nothing is to be taxed because everything is at arm's length. You have to look at the contractual obligations and the nature of services being rendered by each of them coupled with their physical uh, uh, stay and the activities being conducted. Because that's how any treaty triangle you can solve. Party A, party, a, party B and party C. The relation between A and B once it's established that it is of either a subsidiary and uh, parent and subsidiary or a branch as the case may be. Are you able to attribute a particular income that you are generating from this to that? If yes, how will you compute it? And then, is it an agency PE of yours? That's how we'll do it. It will not make too much of a difference ultimately in terms of uh, distribution among your own uh, entities. 
but but how are they like analyzing this transaction from because generally i guess this is happening recently in many no, of gen all. generally so many things happen but no but are they even trapping this transaction somehow or no, trying to no no if your question is about tracking by the revenue yes most transactions are being tracked at some point in time we will start getting information about how these transactions are happening because they are uh, collecting uh, details about different companies see for bigger companies you already have this master file regulations wherein you give out entity uh, details of all your constituent entities so and even for certain companies where you are not required to file part b you are filing part a so they know whom we are transacting with so at some point in time they'll be able to collect the data and come back to you with a questionnaire if your question is about department knowing it if not today they will know it tomorrow no but the, in the advisory when we give to a non resident on this so obviously we highlight all this uh, no, advisory i can give it to you separately as a general <laughs> <laughs> okay, no no, you are hitting on a bread and butter <laughs> in cpu you can't uh, take away my bread and butter <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? I think we'll close. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for reiterating the importance of interpreting each word. For example, is, any. Thank you, sir. I request uh, CA Pramodar Egde, the vice chairman, to present a token of appreciation from our end, sir.